in this time of social distancing, thank you all for not being here. I will present to you our article, Quantum Security Analysis of Seaside, which is a joint work with André Schrottenloer. First of all, Seaside is a key exchange that fits into the framework of hard homogeneous spaces, which were introduced by Couvain. To have such a space, you want a group action between an abelian group G on a set X, and uh, you want that um, this group action is such that it is easy to evaluate, but hard to invert. And from uh, such a space, uh, it is very simple to devise a non-interactive key exchange. Two parts only have to agree on a, on a base point X, and um, to choose a, a secret group element that we note alpha and beta. Then they will both exchange the um, group action of their secret element over the base point and from this information they can agree on a shared secret by applying their secret element on the values they've received. This protocol is very reminiscent of standard Diffie-Hellman and indeed we can see Diffie-Hellman as a special case of hard homogeneous space. In order to have a secure protocol of course we want that it is hard to obtain the secret value given the public ones. Now, Seaside uh, in practice, uh, it's an instance of hard homogeneous spaces whose uh, set is a set of super singular elliptic curves over a prime field and uh, whose group is their class group. And for uh, the group action, each element of the class group can be as associated can canonically to an isogeny and the image of a curve is um, the image curve through the, the isogeny. And uh, for Seaside, uh, the, the concrete parameters are chosen such that uh, there are many isogenies of small degrees that are available. And uh, the, the secret isogeny is uh, sampled as a, a product of these uh, small isogenies up to a small power. So this, this power will be bounded by 10 in the proposed instances. And it is such that um, this set of secret isogenies shall almost span the whole set of possible isogenies. Now that we've seen uh, Seaside for the securities, base security parameters is the number of uh, distinct keys, so of distinct isogenies, which uh, is roughly the size of the class group, which itself uh, is close to the square root of p. So from that, uh, the authors have proposed uh, three instances of Seaside from 512 bits to 1792 bits. And uh, each uh, is expected to have a security that corresponds to a NIST le level, so NIST 1 to 5. And uh, I recall that uh, this NIST level means that it shall be as hard to break the system than to perform both a classical or a quantum exhaustive search on uh, the corresponding variable of AES. Now if we want to cryptanalyze Seaside, the classical cryptanalysis is fairly simple. We consider that we have two curves that are linked by a secret isogeny that we note alpha and uh, we can recover this alpha if we find two isogenies, uh, G1, G2, that comes from each of the, of the two curves and that arrive on the same image curve. And in that case, we can uh, directly uh, recover alpha. And uh, as uh, the, the size of, of the group is roughly a square root of p, a collision finding will allow us to recover alpha in roughly p to the fourth. And for the quantum cryptanalysis, the idea is fairly similar, but seen in a slightly different way. We define two functions that correspond to the evaluation of the group action from an element of the, of the class groups so that we note f and g on each of the two curves. And we would want to find the secret value alpha by leveraging as a very specific properties that these two functions are equal up to a shift of their input of alpha. Now, before detailing our quantum attacks, we need to talk a bit our, about our cost models. In uh, this presentation, we will consider hybrid attacks, that is, quantum attacks that will defer part of their computations to a classical computers. And in order to uh, 
estimate the available resources, we consider that uh, an attacker has has at, at, at most uh, enough resources to, to break AES quantumly and classically. And now for more detailed cost metrics for the quantum part of our um, computations. We consider the circuit model. We try to have a limited number of, of qubits, as limited as possible, and we do not consider a quantum RAM access, contrary to, uh, for example, what Chris has proposed in his analysis of Seaside. And for the classical cost, we allow ourselves to be slightly less precise in, in the estimate, and we allow classical RAM access. Now, in order to make our quantum attack, we first need to implement the, the seaside oracle, that is, a quantum circuit that, given an element of the class group, evaluates the, the group action for, from a fixed curve. And this uh, computation is, in general, hard to do. However, in the case of of C side, we are given many small degree isogenies by the protocol, and we can leverage that to make this evaluation more efficient. This is done in two steps. First of all, we pre-compute the class group using Shor's algorithm, and once we've done that, we compute an approximate short basis of the relation lattice of these small degree isogenies. These two pre-computations will be negligible in the cost of the attack because the dimension will not be that large. And uh, then for each qu quantum query, what we will do is first to decompose the uh, isogeny over um, our base using Baba's algorithm, and finally to evaluate th this sequence of small isogeny with hopefully a small enough power for, uh, for each one. In practice, uh, for our um, quantum circuit, we built uh, upon the work of Bernstein, Lange, Martin Dane, and Pani from last year with two main uh, differences. The first one is that we reduced uh, the number of qubits from uh, hundreds of millions to hundreds of thousands at worst using some un intermediate un un computations and then trade off. And, uh, when uh, we need to sample points over an elliptic curve, we use quantum sampling instead of alligator. Overall, this allows us to have some cost estimates for this, this oracle, so for the three proposed instances of seaside that range from 2 to the 52 gates to 2 to the 63, with a limited number of qubits, so up to um, hundreds of thousands of qubits. Of course, some other trade-offs are possible between the number of gates and the number of qubits, and you can try it between them depending on the amount of available resources you have. Now that we have constructed our quantum oracle, we want to solve um, our hidden shift problem, that is, given black box access to these two <laughs> quantum oracle that corresponds to the evaluation of the group action, find the secret group values that links uh, them both. So in, in other words, we have two functions, f and, and g, which are equal up to a shift on their input, and we want to know the value of this secret shift. Classically, uh, this problem is not that interesting because it reduces uh, to collision finding, but quantumly we can leverage this uh, specific shift pro property to obtain much more efficient algorithm. Now, the, all these uh, algorithm uh, uses what we call labeled qubits. I will present them now a modulo a power of two, but we can uh, devise very similar algorithms that have uh, roughly the same cost uh, for any uh, abelian group. The idea is to start from the all zero state, then we uh, compute using Hadamard gates a uniform superposition over the first two registers, then we apply the quantum oracles we've constructed before. This allows us to, to obtain the uniform superposition of all inputs and outputs over f and g. Then we um, measure the, la the last register. We obtain a random image of the function. And thanks to the hidden shift promise, this project the first two register over this superposition for an, an unknown value x0. Now, from this superposition, we apply a quantum Fourier transform on the second register, which um, allows 
as to, to obtain a uniform superposition on, over L, but with uh, different phases. And if we measure this L, what we obtain is a superposition of 0 and 1 with a very specific phase shift and it's presented here that only depends over L, which is classically known because we've just measured it, and S, which is the value that we want. And now, all the principles of hidden shift algorithm would be to extract this value of S given these labeled qubits. So first of all, we can uh, remark that for some, with some specific labels, we can obtain some inf information uh, on, the, um, on, on the secret uh, directly. For example, with the label 2 to the n minus 1, this uh, qubit will be 0 plus 1 if uh, s is even and 0 minus 1 if s is odd. Hence, if we can construct it, we can uh, recover the parity of s and uh, we can do very similarly for other bits of S using some other label qubits. So how can we construct such a qubit? Uh, the first uh, idea is due to Kuperberg in 2005, which is simply to use a CNOT to take two label qubits, destroy them, and produce a new label qubit whose face, depending on the measurement in the, in the circuit, will either be the sum of the or the difference of the two previous labels. And from this very simple circuit, we can devise an efficient algorithm. The idea is to begin with a large number of labeled qubits and to look for pairs which will be equal modulo a power of 2. And when we find such pairs, we combine them. And uh, if we are lucky, we obtain a new label, uh, which will be uh, a multiple of a power of 2. And uh, once we've done that, we obtain a smaller list of labels, which will all be multiples of a small, of a power of 2. And we can iterate and so on, until uh, in the end, we will obtain uh, labels, which, which will either be 0 or 2 to the n minus 1. And this allows us to product the value we want. So the general algorithm principle is to begin with many random labeled qubits and to combine them to converge to the labels we want. This uh, algorithm is sub-exponential. Its asymptotic complexity is in 2 to the square root of 2 log 3 of n up to some polynomial factors both in quantum time and in quantum memory. And we can have a low quantum memory because we need to have this large list of labeled qubits in memory in order to combine, uh, to combine them. So now that uh, we have uh, our um, quantum algorithm, if we want to use it on C side, first of all, uh, the group <laughs> order for C side is not a power of two, so we need to apply some variants. Uh, so for there are two ways to, to do that. The classical way is that for odd order groups you converge to 1 and not to 2 to the n minus 1, uh, considering higher order bits instead of lower order bits. And for composite groups you do um, uh, a mix of the both approaches. But there is um, Another approach, which is that for cyclic groups or groups that have a huge cyclic component, as it is the case in NC side, we can work modulo a power of 2 and hope that uh, the final equality will hold over the integers and not only uh, over um, modulo 2, 2 to the n. And in, in that case, we will obtain the label we, we want. And we've uh, simulated this uh, latter um, approach. And uh, from simulations, heuristically, we obtain a concrete cost uh, of uh, 2 to the 1.8 square root of n plus uh, 4.3, which roughly matches the asymptotic estimates with a small constant as uh, the polynomial overhead. Now that we have a query cost and that we know the cost of the quantum oracle, we can uh, estimate uh, the overall cost of uh, the attack using this variant of a hidden shift algorithm. And uh, we can see that for the large instances of C-side, uh, the number of required T-gates will be smaller than uh, the number of, of T-gates required to do a quantum search on the corresponding variant of AES. 
this algorithm has two limitations. The first one is that it requires a large amount of qubits from a billion to 2 to the 56 depending on the instances and that we don't really have any degree of freedom to increase the classical time and here we waste a lot of, of classical time. We could use much more and if we want to to have more freedom, we need to use a different variant of hidden shift. For example, we can use Regis variant. The principles are fairly similar for, for this variant, but the combination is different. The idea is not to use two qubits to combine, but uh, a small number, k. And we consider the tensor product of all these uh, k k-labeled qubits, which uh, corresponds to a superposition of two to the k values each value having its specific phase shift. Then we compute the value of uh, the phase shift modulo a power of two for each of the component of the superposition. Once we, we've done that, we measure the value we've just computed and this will project the superposition of uh, two to the k value to the subset of values whose phase modulo 2 to the n, m will be equal to uh, the thing we've just measured. And now from that what we can do is uh, to extract uh, two uh, values in the superposition that have uh, the correct phase. So we can do this, uh, do this classically because all the values are classically known. And uh, once we've uh, done that then we can project on these two values. And uh, finally, we can relabel our uh, superposition and map one of them to zero and the other to one. And uh, once we've done that, we will obtain a new labeled qubit whose phase will be the difference of the two phases of the two components we had we had found. And by construction, this uh, phase difference will be a multiple of two to the n. So now, in order to obtain an efficient quantum algorithm, we can use, as before, this method iteratively to obtain labels which are multiple of larger and larger per of two. But here we have a huge difference than before, which is that the, we have a large classical cost which amounts in computing the solution of uh, this, uh, this equation, which corresponds to the phase uh, of, the, of the elements in the superposition. So this uh, algorithm has been uh, estimated by Chai Zhao and Sukar and Sukarev, and they obtained an asymptotic cost in two to the square root of two n log of n, which is worse than the previous asymptotic uh, estimate. But it uh, gains in the fact that we use only a linear amount of quantum memory. Now we can remark that we have, uh, in fact, a lot of possible ways to make this algorithm work. And uh, in particular, we can uh, play on the size of uh, the, the number of, of qubits we, we, we combine. And uh, if we increase the number of qubits we combine at, at each step, then we, we will increase the classical cost. But uh, on the other hand, it will allow us to, to perform less steps, which will decrease the number of required queries. And in fact, if we look um, a bit more closely to uh, the uh, equation of the, of the phase uh, in the superposition, we can remark that this corresponds to a subset sum instance, which means that we can use classical um, algorithm for a subset sum in order to find the, the, sol the solutions. And uh, if we want to have a really low um, quantum cost, as low um, as possible, then uh, we can reduce this algorithm to only one step. And in this case, we would have a very small num number of required quantum queries, so only a quadratic amount. But the classical cost will be exponential with the exponent of subset sum, so 2 to the point 0.291 at the time of the, of the paper, in time and memory. And now from this um, cost e estimate, we can uh, obtain concrete cost by plugging the cost of the oracle. And we see that uh, we have, as expected, 
uh, lower T gate count than uh, than before. We also have a lower number of required qubits because the here we are bonding by the number of qubits in the quantum oracle, but at the expense of having a much larger classical time uh, for the attack. And of course, there are also some other trade-offs. And if you, you allow a larger quantum cost, then the classical cost will quickly decrease. This uh, allows for many trade-offs with uh, this uh, quantum algorithm. However, it uh, is outperformed in many cases by Kuperberg's second algorithm, which is very similar with the difference that we do not do the last projection in a rugged variant, and in this case, we no longer have subset sum, but but we have list merging problems, and uh, the the overall um, shape of, of this algorithm is extremely similar. We I do not detail this uh, algorithm, but we we do it in the paper, and we obtain some other trade-offs between the classical and quantum time. So. Overall, we've uh, seen uh, multiple um, hybrid uh, attacks over, uh, over C sides, and we can ask what would be uh, a set of parameters that is safe and that cannot be uh, attacked by uh, such qu quantum algorithms. Unfortunately, the NIST metrics are not precise enough to uh, provide a definitive answer to this qu question, so we propose two sets of parameters for list level one. The first one is an aggressive set uh, of parameters, so we consider that uh, NIST level one means that we can have a have a classical time memory product of 2 to the 128 and that the quantum oracle is such that we can afford 2 to the 20 queries and in that case we would need a prime of roughly 2000 bits in order to avoid the, these attacks. If we want to be more conservative, for example, we can consider that NIST level 1 means that you can have access to 2 to the 128 classical time and 2 to the 64 classical memory and uh, if you're more optimistic on the quantum oracle you can consider that it allows for 2 to the 40 quantum queries and in that case we would need a much larger prime so roughly 5000 bits to conclude, uh, the quantum attacks uh, on C sides have many degrees of freedom that allows us, depending on the amount of resources we consider, to trade between classical and quantum time, classical memory, and number of qubits. As we have a sub-exponential algorithm, it means that the safe instances are harder to estimate because a small change in the way we count um, the cost of the attack can lead to uh, a significant uh, change in the, the corresponding parameters. And uh, finally, here we consider that the NIST le levels depend on the concrete time and not only on a number of queries, which means that a classical Im improvement on uh, the execution of the seaside protocol may lead to a, an improvement of the quantum circuits for, for seaside and improve the um, quantum attacks.